This episode was recorded on the 27th of April, 2022 in Colorado, Denver. In this episode, I sat with a brilliant crew of engineers and scientists who isolated themselves for two weeks in the desert to test different technologies and operational scenarios in an environment that mimics, as closely as possible, the harsh conditions on Mars. The goal of these experiments is to contribute to the preparation for future human missions to Mars. The mission is called SMOPS, or Space Medicine Operations, an analog mission at the Mars Desert Research Station, which is a research facility owned and managed by the Mars Society. I never quite comprehended the idea of an analog mission, so I'm lucky to be joined by the main crew who conducted the mission. Vittorio, Paolo, Simone, Luca, and Benjamin explained to me firsthand what is an analog mission and what is a simulation. They also shared with me what happens behind the scenes and what they went through being two weeks in the desert conducting experiments with very limited supply of resources. I should point out that there's one crew member missing from our conversation. Nadia Marouf, the sixth crew member who was the health and safety officer and medical scientist of the mission. I'm hoping that one day I could speak to her to get her insight and perspective of the mission and the data that was being collected. I hope you enjoy this conversation as much as I did. The category that is more like physical, in the sense, for example, gravity is different. And the winds, there are winds, but there are the density is much lower. So there are things that change your way of being with the environment. In other things that put you in danger, they are not existent on Earth because we're all here. And so the perception of danger in analog missions is much lower because you know that you're not, if you go outside without the suit, you're not gonna die. On Mars, we, we would. that you have a very busy schedule and we're tight so I'm hoping to get the best conversation with you and what you actually accomplished for the past two weeks um, I would like to start before we say what you actually did I would like to start by introducing everyone if you can please tell me about you and yourself and anything you'd like to share with the audience Okay, my name is Simone Paternostro. I'm an Italian engineer, but I live in, uh, in the Netherlands where I work as a, it's called Payload Integration Manager. Uh, I coordinate, there's a team that coordinates and manages the, uh, the execution of payloads and experiment on board the ISS. So my background is space engineering and I studied in Rome and did I, I did my PhD in the in UK in a navigation system. Sorry. Well, I, I'm Vittorio and uh, <laughs> I'm, I, I'm a space architect mo mostly. Um, I, I studied both like architectural and space engineering. I work at a researcher at the University of Houston and uh, also as a consultant for different aerospace companies. And uh, yeah, my job is basically to, um, to design um, future assets for uh, human space exploration, such as like a space station, lunar Martian bases, and such. I'm um, Luca, Luca Rossettini. I'm the CEO and founder of The Orbit. The Orbit is one of the new space companies, actually the first company to deliver uh, space logistics and, in, and transportation services. We deliver in orbit more than 90 payloads already. We have five satellites in orbit right now. And uh, the reason why I decided to participate in this mission, it's really to understand uh, what it takes uh, in terms of like people behavior uh, and also resilience in order to live in such conditions. Uh, imagine that tomorrow, or the day after tomorrow, we will have the chance to be on Mars. Hello, I'm Paolo Guardabasso, and I'm in Italian as well, and I'm a PhD student at the University of Toulouse in France, and um, I, uh, I also traveled a lot in the past few years, and uh, now my subjects are multi-body dynamics, and I work especially with Space debris applied to lunar exploration. Okay. Hello, so my name is uh, Benjamin Potier. I'm French. Uh, I'm a fellow international of the Explorers Club. 
Uh, as filmmaker and photographer, and uh, I also hold a PhD in anthropology from Team of University. Okay, so thank you. I think it's a great presence to have all of the all of you here in one room. Um, so let's start with what is the mission, what is a simulation, and what have you been doing for the past two weeks? Uh, well, I start. Um, as commander, <laughs> or like a former commander of the Crew 245. Um, so the, the Crew 45, um, or like SMOPS, that stand for uh, Space Medicine Operations, um, mission was exactly like the acronym says. It was based on uh, research about uh, um, space medicine, that's, and that's included, uh, of course, like a a huge range of different uh, uh, aspect and factor to consider. Uh, our was our mission was focused on uh, research about, for example, um, monitoring of the health uh, status of the astronauts, uh, but also um, some experiments about uh, the, um, for example, psychological standard in um, in uh, EDA activities. Uh, such navigation, for example, uh, but also we had some technology, technological based experiments such a, as a satellite tracking or a 3D printing, um, uh, and also uh, another uh, sector was about uh, the uh, sampling and geology study, uh, uh, DNA um, sequencing uh, of uh, like of uh, soil samples. So there was a, a huge range of experiments that we conducted. The idea behind those missions is exactly to simulate uh, on a certain degree of, uh, um, uh, of like, uh, uh, like um, capability of simulate aspects of the first sort of generation of uh, Mars exploration missions. Uh, until now on Mars, we had just robots, we still have some of them active exploring and providing uh, uh, samples and uh, um, readings, sensor readings. Uh, but at a certain point, all this uh, knowledge that we are accumulating uh, through these like uh, autonomous uh, assets, they are designed to um, to help us organizing the first human missions on the Red Planet. We still don't know when this will happen because it's a very uh, complex uh, environment and it's very distant from Earth so we have to be sure that everything uh, will go accordingly to the uh, purpose of the mission uh, or at least that the astronauts will have the, the tools to solve the, the, the problems and to face the unknowns by themselves and this is one was exactly one of the purpose of our mission to test technologies that will help astronauts to face emergency situations uh, and unknowns, uh, and it's good that we can uh, we have uh, environments such the analogs uh, that uh, help us to test those mm, procedures and technologies in a safe environment, um, but still similar as possible to what Mars would be. So, just to back off for people who wouldn't necessarily know what most of this means. So you go with a set of experiments and objectives and goals in the middle of almost nowhere, and then you test it because it's similar to a Martian environment. Okay, so I know that Benjamin, you've been on a lot of these analog missions. So what do you, what can you tell us about the general overview when you've attended many missions what are the similarities? What are the challenges of, of actually being in a place for two weeks sure. conducting experiments? Yeah. Sure, the similarities. So for, uh, for the one we just did, uh, the uh, analogy of the mission was also because the terrain around looks like Mars, uh, but the analog mission, uh, it's about having analog boosts, uh, sets of um, uh, ways of experiencing the daily life. So, for example, in most missions, when you go on EVS or extravehicular activities, you, when you go outside 
the station, which is a closed environment, you have to wear a simulation suit that mimics the way uh, Martians are having. And human Martians uh, would go on EVA outside. So that's one of the procedures that we mimic. So it's in a way to, um, it helps to, uh, to understand, the, for example, the psychological pressure that it could bring to a future crew on Mars. Uh, most of the mission, there is also uh, nutrition studies or nutrition restriction. Uh, most of the time it's freeze-dried food. Most of the time have been, we only have freeze-dried food. Uh, very few, um, and sometimes you can have some basil or stuff like this, but you know, if you have a greenhouse, but most, most of the time it's only freeze-dried. Uh, we have, in most missions, what they call in the ISS um, uh, daily task orders. Uh, so our uh, planning um, is, uh, is prepared in advance. Depending on what kind of mission, you have more or less freedom, but uh, your, your schedule is pretty tightly organized. Okay, so basically, with this mission, you try to mimic as much as possible all the conditions of a Martian environment. Why do they call it analog? Is it just because it's on Earth, or...? It's because of the analogy. It's not digital and analog, but it's the question of uh, analogy as similarity. Oh. Okay, that's interesting. Analogous. And all this time for two weeks, look, you've been talking about behavioral and psychological aspects of the mission. All of this time, you're actually wearing spacesuits. Well, so um, while you are inside the base, you can wear pretty much what you want. Uh, we have two types of suits. One is a working suit that we were working inside, and then it's uh, then we had the space suit that we were wearing on the EVA activities, so extravehicular activities, when we, we were going outside. It's actually a suit design to withstand uh, like temperature uh, difference. So it's, uh, it's not a real space suit, but it's, uh, let's say, a first stage uh, of development from a, like a sponsor company uh, that they want to test the materials and the, the suit in order to get to the next step, and maybe in the future also have a real space suit. And when you do that, is there daily reports that you have to write yeah. and take feedback from everyone? On yeah. yeah, so let's say uh, every person in this crew have two roles. One role is related to the experiments that Vittorio was explaining. So each of us has different experiments uh, and then we can, we can go through them. I think they are all interesting experiments. The second role is really a crew role. So uh, Vittorio was a commander, the, the executive uh, chief officer, and we had the journalist, and we had the scientist, and we had also the, the um, like Nadia that was in charge of all the medical activities and the, and the experiment related to medical activities, and I, I, I was the, the, the crew engineer, and basically I was in charge of cleaning up the toilet. So that's, uh, <laughs> that's, that's very important when you are, you know, like six people in very small place, <laughs> but anyway. So, and uh, and this second role is very important. So each of us has to send reports at the end of the day, explaining what happened, the status of the base, if some something happened, uh, either during the missions outside of the base, or if the facility is, uh, is in a good shape. Because uh, if you are on Mars and you have a leakage, uh, then you are risking your life. So everything shall be under control. So that's why the schedule was particularly tight. So you don't have a lot of spare time. So you wake up in the morning, you start the activities, either you go outside the base and you, do, you start working on your experiments, uh, or you stay inside and you still work on your experiments, or you have many other activities that you need to, uh, to take care of. Uh, yes, there are breaks for lunch and dinner, but as uh, Ben was saying, uh, the food is what it is, right? So you, you are really exper experiencing the real, uh, the real Mars uh, let's say, simulation. We were lucky, I have to say, because we had uh, Chef Poitier. Uh, he is uh, like a magician. He was able to transform the, the freeze-dry food in uh, something that was actually delicious. I was eating better here in the simulation than in my house. So, uh, But anyway, so yeah. And so once you write these reports about all of these experiments, is there, do you go through all the steps that you have um, said that you will go through the experiments or after you see the reports, you adjust the experiments accordingly? I mean, who reads the reports and how do you move forward day to day? So, um, especially in this particular station, the, the mission support, they don't 
influence the experiments. So the experiments are 100% the responsibility of the crew, while what Luca was saying, they are the batch of reports, the ones related to the station uh, maintenance and operations, those they actually have uh, answers and we get requests in terms of main maintenance to do and checks, uh, tests to do and so on. For the experiments, we had to do adjustments. Uh, they were communicated sometimes with the PIs, the principal investigators, they were on the earth. <laughs> uh, or ourselves, we were the, the principal investigators. So um, it was the case for, for Nadia, for example. So we, we had to do some adjustments because of uh, we were isolated, as you said. We couldn't, we had to, we received some cargo when we started the mission, so at the beginning, but then there was no way to get extra things, or if something was broken, there was no way to, there was no way to fix it in a simple way. We were stuck, so some things had to be adjusted and made simpler. And this is something that they tell you actually before you go. Uh, there is a manual of the station, and they say don't like expect to do half of what you hope, yeah, hope to do. For example, uh, we we were building this ground station, uh, like a communication uh, with antenna to communicate with with my satellites in orbit to simulate the delivery of scientific data from Mars to Earth. And what happened is that we find out that one of the components of the ground station was broken. So what do you do? You are on Mars. So we, we try to figure out another way, and we have to to assemble the station outside with the with the suit and the gloves and screwing the screw with with the, So it was quite quite a complex activity, and uh, and then we bypass the the wrong component and we said okay we, we can't receive but at least we can send. So let's see if we are able to send anyway. So it's uh, you have to live with 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 what you have. And, uh, and you have to be creative in that way. Sometimes you need to like pivot, uh, even the experiment. In, in other cases, you just need minor adjustments, uh, but definitely you have to be you know, conscious that uh, if something can go wrong, it will, it will go wrong. So, and, and you have to take care of that. So as a person who's trying to represent whoever is listening, um, for the people who really don't know um, lots of the engineering concepts that you were working with, for example, if we have a problem, so let's say on Earth, and there is an issue to bypass a technical problem, Google it. Did you have the same? Like, I don't know if the on the Martian environment you'll be able to have that much network access. Network access. So technically, you really have to rely on whatever information you have. So. Yeah, that's one of the main challenge between on a mission on Mars is that the the communication delay between Mars and Earth can change from 8 to 20 minutes. So definitely you cannot just Google stuff on Mars. So then, so yeah, m one of the main challenges is to get ready. So to prepare everything you might need from procedure, manuals, documentation that might you need for um, technical adjustments or try to figure out how to uh, troubleshooting uh, um, an element or components. So that's one of the main challenges together with all the safety uh, related aspects. So all the safety system, all the life support system, you have, as uh, Luca was saying, you need to be sure that are always in working condition. You need to have all this documentation, <laughs> which cannot always rely on Earth to have answers. So that's would be, it's one of the challenges for a manned mission is to prepare the crew to be there and be kind of independent from on different aspects. So all of us, more or less, we had uh, for each experiment, we have our own procedure manuals that we can go through to see if we can fix the problem. Like we had also another experiment uh, for uh, my, the one I was following, the microbiology. For, like for Luca, I had a component that was broken and that really completely, uh, let's say, uh, stopped the experiment. So I could uh, extract DNA from the different samples that I collected, but I was not able to use this analyzer uh, to, to extract the information on DNA sample. So I just prepare everything and then pack everything and send back to the VA in this case so he could analyze himself. But on Mars, that would have been either find a different solution, either 3D printing components or uh, build your own system. Uh, or yeah, you need to find a solution or in the worst case scenario, you have to delay the experiment until maybe a later cargo may supply additional hardware. So basically, at least at the beginning, not everyone can go to Mars. I, I, I think it's <laughs> mainly people who actually know most of the aspects of whatever they have to deal with in order to... Yeah, that's for the, the astronauts for the, space, the International Space Station. They spend like years in training, understanding the different system, 
some of them they get specialized in a specific system or experiment so there will be the specialist that will handle the experiment or the system and that's what they do before a mission it takes like a few years to get ready for a mission and the same will be for mars in that case even more because they will be more independent from earth as well but you know what i think actually yeah. that i think uh, you will need very prepared very trained like people trained up, up to perfection um, as a crew uh, but then, if you have a crew in the spaceship to, to Mars, then you can have like regular people, right? So it's like when you fly in the plane, you have trained people, you have the pilot, you have the the, the, the flight assistants, yeah. right? That it's taking care of everything, and they need to be trained. They need to be perfect. They need to know what 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 to do in case of emergency and everything. But then you don't need to be trained to take a plane. So I think we 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 will get there. Probably at the beginning, the first missions will be only for few and very, very well-trained astronauts. But then, right after, thanks to the commercialization of space, we will have that all those people will, uh, will be hired by commercial companies to bring like regular people back and forward to Mars. I think also that um, one aspect that is different from the space station uh, and what we train the astronauts for, at least in the modern age of the space exploration, is that the Martian astronaut will be trained more for the unknown than for procedures. Um, like uh, now on the ISS, we have extremely defined procedures for everything, and if something goes wrong, there is a procedure to escape the space station and go back to Earth. And we don't have that on Mars. So while I think that, the like the Apollo astronauts, uh, we will need people that are more uh, Train it to think out of the box and uh, and to be ready to react to an uh, unforeseen situation, then astronaut trained exactly to follow the procedure in the most like uh, uh, precise way. This actually is a good point because it brings me to my next question: is that you are going, you're doing the simulation, trying to mimic as many things as possible that you can, but then there are lots of things that you can't mimic. So basically when you can't mimic it, you can't practice it. Mm -hmm. So can you kind of briefly list the like the things that you know you've kind of be able to practice on Earth, but the things that you are unreachable, like being in that environment with that regolith? Like radiation, the danger of radiation, for example, that's the main one, I guess. Mm -hmm. The difference in the <laughs> atmosphere. I mean, uh, mm -hmm. where you use an un unpressurized suit, but in reality, is that whoever is going to Mars outside for extravehicular activity, you need a pressurized suit, and it's, yeah. you can still test it on here, but it would be a different environment because it's that's more like a differential pressure between yeah, the exactly. Yeah. Side, yes. There is a category that is more like physical in the sense, for example, gravity is different, mm -hmm. and the winds. There are winds, but there are the density is much lower. So there are things that change your way of behaving with the environment, and other things that put you in danger that are not existent on Earth. Or here. Uh, so the perception of danger in analog missions is much lower because you know that you're not, if you go outside without the suit, you're not going to die. On Mars, you, will, you would. So they, there, is some, there is some work to do, analog to change, depending. But in general, um, they don't provide this, this, we were discussing this, yeah. the perception of danger. It's also a question of ethics, basically, because you know, you, you can. You can't uh, play too much with human beings as in a big to make them face danger so yeah. that you can prepare to send them to Mars. You know. so it's, uh, it's really balanced, so it's a question of analogy. And um, uh, my exam the example I always use is that uh, if you know how to drive a car, it will be easier for you if you one day you need to drive a truck. And if you are a scientist or an astronaut candidate and you participate to an analog, you will have some uh, field experience that you can't find in the books, basically. And then you can elaborate on this experience to, to be well prepared for the real thing. And I think that that works especially also with the um, crew mechanism uh, in the way that, especially when uh, you are a group of few people uh, and um, you're isolated. And so there is no way, and so especially also the space, it's very limited uh, disposition of every crew member, no? And also there are safety measures for which, for example, you can't just isolate yourself. You need someone that can check on you and you can check on, on, on the other one. 
I think that it's extremely important to when they will select people for a martial mission to specific profiles of, um, that uh, uh, that are really um, like uh, they're really uh, like flexible towards like working together and adjust their personality um, for because this is uh, this is a big issue still today uh, and we we still like it. it's it's part of every NASA report because also NASA and space agents all the space agents they conduct those uh, analog missions uh, and um, one of the big problems is uh, always the human component uh, because the human component um, especially for people I have to say that uh, are uh, technicians and are very well trained in uh, in their matter sometimes it's easy to lose the the uh, the human side no? and especially when you are in a situation in which you are always constantly in danger uh, and also you have to think that the, um, a martial mission will last at least like three years uh, for a, a physiological uh, nature of um, uh, like flight dynamics, uh, orbital dynamics, and uh, um, and so uh, the astronaut will need to do to, uh, six not to nine months travel, go to go there and stay there around like two years before there are again the condition to go back to Earth. That means it's three years of constant stress um, in a, in, a, in an environment that can kill you in any moment and without an escape. Odd, like an escape. Like Australia. <laughs> <laughs> like our ra restroom. Okay. Um, uh, but so that's why I'm saying that um, you don't need just very good technicians, but you need also very good humans <laughs> to have a successful martial mission. That's a good point. Also, to bring you to the other question is that all of the simulation mission it sounds like there were a set of experiments, and all your roles were both. Uh, experimenting and also working and doing multiple things. Were there people as part of the simulation where they were the subjects of actually having to be trained or like you said with the ethics of actually testing different scenarios on people, were there test subjects that were um, reporting on the food for example or reporting on the psychological aspects who didn't necessarily have a technical role? Yeah, yeah. Uh, one experiment from our medical doctor that she had to get the ethical approval from the university for conducting because we were subjects. She was collecting physiological data from us that she's going to analyze post mission because there she was testing a, a garment. It's called Astro Skin. It's also used by astronauts um, to gather information to analyze to see how our body reacts in different situations from EVAs to in, uh, normal lifetime inside the station so yeah there is a there is the ethical part so they need there are experiments in many um, analog mission there is the human physiology part of psychology as well and the experiment needs to have the approval the ethical approval to go ahead and use the astronaut analog astronauts as a subjects and um so you were how big was the entire place where you mm -hmm. were was smaller than this place, yeah. Yeah, way smaller. So, way smaller than this. So, yes. the, the habitat part, yes. I mean, it was, it was on the was also floor. The idea when they designed the, um, the MDRS, the first research station, it was the volume was uh, kind of similar to the biggest volume that we uh, took in space, uh, that was like with the Saturn V. Uh, so, they took that volume and they made out the, the habitat on that shape, it's a cylindrical shape of two floors. Um, the diameter is eight meters? Yes, it's eight meters. Eight enough. meters, yes. Yeah. It's, if you think about the fact that... It's like the Hestia with the 20 feet. The? The Hestia and the... Yes, uh, exactly. If you oh. think that, for example, now the, star, the, the SpaceX Starship is nine meters in diameter, it's kind of fit, the idea. Yeah. And how many people were six, there? Six. six. We were six. six. Uh, the, the station uh, allowed until seven people and what happens when you do clash or have conflict and <laughs> what happens then? Why, we did not add any, any you must, Well, I mean, th th there were some situations, some friction, let's say, but there's always one other person in the crew that actually mediate. 
And yeah. that's, uh, so we were selected in a, not randomly, so there was a selection process and they put together people that theoretically on paper that they can live with each other, but that until you test it for real, you, you, you don't know. So the role of each of us it's, it was always to mediate in case you, you have to understand that the friction is coming even before it's coming, right? So, uh, yeah, if you, you have to see it coming. Uh, but it didn't happen actually, I think, uh, only a couple of times. Yeah. And, uh, and it was for like very lucky, I think, too. Yeah. The was so I, I think it's important to know how to defuse a situation before it explodes. Uh, and uh, I have to say that probably most of the friction, they came also from the experiments because uh, you go see us in charge of experiment and you feel that you have to do whatever it takes to, to uh, like have a successful experiment. And especially if when that experiment involves other crew member, mm -hmm. no, uh, I think it's uh, it's difficult to don't push too much the other crew members to dedicate time and effort uh, to your experiment because at the same time they feel that it's not their experiment. And this was a case exactly also the, of the shirt because the shirt we had to keep it on 24 hours for two weeks. And I, I think that everyone at a certain point was extremely uh, like not positive about this situation uh, because it was uncomfortable. Like, and we also had an headband. Yes, yeah, it was a headband. For me, the headband was the uh, most annoying. Yeah. The, the shirt, I forgot. So, what about the shirt and the headband? Like, what? It's yeah. so a sensorized t shirt that you put on, that you have to like wear for 24 hours, 15 days, and then you have a, a band here that is also connected. So, every time you move, you have a wine. Yeah. It's, it's uh, for blood pressure. Yeah, and, and when you go outside in EVA, you, you also have all the, the garments, the, the spacesuits and everything, but you are still wearing this. And uh, if it is too hot, you sweat and you have, I mean, it's. Um, it's something that you have, you need to get used to. At the end, after 15 days, I have to say, probably the, the, the T-shirt was okay. Yeah. So, you know, it was part of your skin. Uh, <laughs> but the stuff you are wearing in your head, it's, uh, it's it was well, kind of, yeah. And yeah. how long do you have to wear it at a time? And all the time. All yeah. the time. Yeah. We, were allowed, yeah. we, we were allowed only to remove it when we wanted to have a shower. But yeah. for the rest, we were supposed and, to wear it all the time. We were not supposed to have a shower every day. <laughs> <laughs> We have limited resources on that. <laughs> oh, yeah. We have a total of 500 gallons, actually 450 gallons of water for two weeks uh, Six to do everything. Drink, wash, washing the dishes as well, because you need to, to keep prepare meals, the facility clean, meal. prepare the meal. And I mean, the meal was sucking a lot of water because it's dry. It's, uh, it was dry. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so we need to re uh, rehydrate the, the food. So yeah, I mean, it's, uh, but if, if you are on Mars, you also will have a limited resource and you need to live with that. So at the beginning, you need to, to take into consideration that, uh, I mean, you, you did the inventory, right? Yeah. So we have this amount of food and, uh, and these are the days that we need to stay here and this is the amount that we can eat. That's it. Yeah, that's one of the other aspects. They are, it's quite common in analog mission is to have limit, some sort of limited resources, food, power, water. Yeah, it, this is one of the things you can really simulate as, as, as much as you want. Because and I also have like a, a psychological effect of the crew. Yeah. If I have to limit my food intake because it's not enough for everyone, you know, it's like, uh, yeah, it's get dangerous for them. The thing I want to say about friction though is that we were lucky <laughs> that the mission was postponed twice. Twice. Mm -hmm. Because the selection, the crew selection happened in January 2021. Mm -hmm. So we had more than a year to meet. Once every month, and then once every two weeks, and then once a week. Mm -hmm. Remotely, yeah. Remotely, always remotely. We, I only met Simone once, and uh, also Vittorio as well, and Luca briefly. Uh, that, for example, I, I then met Benjamin and Nadia. Uh, but it was, I think that also for the for the shirts, I I had the feeling that we were prepared. We accepted to do it, and it was mentioned every time. So you kind of start preparing, okay, I'm going to do this for you. Yeah. And this is going to be my duty to, to bring to, to wear this shirt. And I, mean, I didn't know about the headband. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly. Yeah, yeah. But, but still. But we were like. Something that I think worked very well is that, uh, and that's actually what I'm expecting from a crew, is that everybody was helping each other. So if you need help on your experiment, and you know, even if I'm delaying mine, I'm helping you. Uh, and that's actually important because it's not the success of a single individual, it's the success of the crew. You have to live with the other people, you depend on the, on the other people. So I think this actually worked very well. So that's why probably we didn't have a, a lot of friction situations. I think everybody, uh, except for Ben, I think, they touched the, the antenna 
Everybody needs oh, yeah. a mentor. Because yeah. <laughs> yeah. it was the most. Because it was the antenna was one of the for me. I already did one mission three three years ago with Vittorio, and the antenna for me was incredible because it was really like something hands on. Yeah. Because you 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 assemble something which is outside, and you have only can access it at certain times when you plan for it and ask for it and get a request and approved. Then you go out and you have clothes and you have to mount and stuff. And this feeling of that was amazing. So Heaven for people who don't know what the antenna does, what does it do? Yeah. So talk to satellites. <laughs> it's a, it's a, so the ground station is a, a bunch of like components that uh, that ends up with an antenna. The antenna is directed towards the satellites. It can uh, send signals to the satellite and retrieve signals from the satellites. And then there is a chain of components that actually enter into the station where you have a server, a computer, that you can command uh, like the antenna. So you can, uh, we have a software that tells when the satellite is uh, on, on the horizon, the antenna start uh, pointing at the satellite and the antenna moves according to the satellite. So you have about six to eight minutes for every visibility window to communicate with the satellite. But it's quite complex because you may have uh, mountains, you may have uh, like the satellite is very far away, you have the, 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 the noise in the, the signal, so uh, like a lot can happen that prevent you to communicate with the satellite. So if you are in emergency, you want to have multiple satellites. Uh, and if you have a broken component, <laughs> that's that's another story. So, so you need to go back and forward and find uh, like creative solutions. So, where is mission control then? It was in a in a small like a, there was a facility attached to the to the main hub that is called RAM. Uh, it's sort of engineering module, uh, module. Uh, and we placed the like all the computers and the the, com the mission control center there. Okay, but For, together with the three D printer. Uh, yes, you were. But yes. you were asking about the ground station or in general? Yeah. The mission uh, support team actually, behind. Actually, yeah. So I was asking about this, but this is a good point. So where is the other side oh, uh, located? Uh, there, I think there's... So the, the, the station director, she lives in Outpost, which is a not campus far, yeah. not far. It's hidden from the station, not to, so that it doesn't break the, the illusion of being isolated from Italy. And actually, we were isolated for a couple of days because the director left. <laughs> and, um, was agreed, and but then the rest of the support that read the reads the report uh, they are scattered around the U.S. Yeah, they are remote. Uh, and also, are, like in our case, in our uh, experiments, uh, ground control they were scattered. Where the experiment came from, like uh, uh, for uh, Luca, uh, was it like uh, in Como? Yeah, uh, yeah, back where we have the real mission control center where we control our own satellites. Like in my case, for my experiments, uh, was uh, in a body in, uh, in Italy. Um, so every, of course, like each, it's kind of what it will happen in a real Martian mission. Like if you have a, a, mm, the PI that uh, Simon was talking about before, uh, that they are the people that plan and design the, exper the experiment and they build also often the hardware that you are taking with, with you. You have to relate directly with them because they are the best. They, they they know the best. Your your thing. The the astronauts. They usually they almost they are never like the PI or the experiment that they do. They they are they just execute. Uh, so if every time on the ISS is very common that when there is a problem or even during normal operation, they are in connection with the the PI or the, the experiments when they perform it. Um, but it also depends on the the mission, who designed a mission. Like for example, for MDRS, they have this set up, so the crew is in one location, the mission supports scatter in different locations. But there are other organizations that do in a different way. Like there is one Austrian uh, organization, they do this kind of mission, they send a group in the location where they do the XD the simulation, but they have like a full mission support, like Houston style, set up at the same time in, in, in Innsbruck. So they spend three, four weeks of the simulation, it's like in Israel or Oman or whatever, in Innsbruck, there is an active support team, 24-7 supporting the team in, in a mission. So it depends on how the, the whole structure of the organization is done. Um, before we move forward, I want to sure, be mindful of your time. I know that you're pressed on time. So let me know so that I know what kind of questions I can ask. Um, I think we have more, at least 10 minutes more. 10 minutes, yeah. It depends. It depends. But it depends on you. <laughs> I think 10 more minutes you can do. Okay, 10 minutes. Okay, so I'll keep my eyes on the watch. So you said that you weren't randomly selected and there was a selection process. What was the eligibility criteria and was were the experiments conducted are 
for you or you were expected to perform somebody else's experiment who's not necessarily on the mission? I'll let you go to the selection. Okay. So the whole mission idea comes from Vittorio and I, uh, and when we contacted the, the chap Italian chapter of the Marsh Society. Marsh Society is the, the, the group that founded the station in the desert 20 years ago and they do a bunch of other activities. They're quite well known in, in the world actually. And the Italian chapter uh, helped us actually. He liked it, the, the president really liked the idea of a mission at the station, so we started organizing. And um, and then and then essentially we, we uh, the, the session itself has criteria for people to, uh, to apply. And we translated those criteria and, and, uh, and essentially opened the applications. And we received some of them. And, um, and we, we, we did essentially interviews with everybody. Um, and uh, Benjamin, I think you, you contacted me on all the pages on Facebook. Or yeah, like, yeah, so I saw the post at the beginning. Yeah. And, um, and then, yeah, we did. We had to do a selection. Uh, the the thing is, this is the first time that actually it's, I think it's the first Italian analog mission in the sense organized in Italy with the, the patronage of the Italian Space Agency. So it's the first time that this happens, to my knowledge. Mm -hmm. I think so. Yeah. So uh, it was not known. So we didn't receive a lot of applications, but uh, we managed to get very very smart people. And uh, I was telling Luca that if we had to redo this again now, with the visibility we got, uh, it would explode, I think. Really. But at the same time, sometimes it's better not to receive too many applications, <laughs> because yeah. most of them, uh, they are not fit for the role. And, uh, it, and uh, I can't imagine how it is in a real astronaut selection, where you uh, receive hundreds thousands of applications that you have to select, like three people. Yeah. Um, but uh, for us, uh, yeah, I think that has been pretty straightforward. It was, Difficult not to choose the people that we choose. <laughs> and was there like a, the roles that you had in mind yes. uh, that you need to hire for, select for these roles? <laughs> or was it mostly what kind of experiments will be conducted? So you pick the people. There were the two aspects. There were the first one, so at MDRS, and this kind of like um, uh, it's apply also to like real missions. There are certain specific roles that you need to cover because they are necessary to the functioning of the mission. Uh, in our case, there were the, the, the commander and the, the executive officer, and after the crew engineer, because someone has to take care of the habitat. Uh, and, uh, That's it. and the health and safety officer, that was Nadia, that is like the medic. Uh, uh, these are the four like, mm, yeah. like yeah, yeah, pillars of the mission. After uh, you can, call, there are all the different roles that can be covered according to their uh, knowledge um, and the, the experiments that they present, like the crew geologist, the crew scientist, the crew journalist, astronomer, astronomer greenhouse officer. There are many of those roles. Um, so once that we covered those four roles, uh, the others they were mostly like uh, applied according to the, their know-how and their background. And also the idea is that uh, for us that every people uh, that apply uh, had to uh, propose mm. an experiment. That experiment uh, could also not be their experiment. They could have someone else uh, they, uh, proposing that experiment, that, but they had to execute it, like if it was, for example, Simone's uh, uh, case. Um, but so also the quality of the experiment proposal was uh, definitely uh, um, yeah, a, a, like a factor that we encountered during the, the selection process. How long did it take you to select everyone? Not long, I think one month. Yes. We managed to do all the interviews and then communicate uh, these guys. <laughs> we did a short, a short list from the first application and we did interview with all the people who shortlisted. Yeah. Yeah. But there are, if you think about it, the, there are some roles at the station and we ended up with a crew journalist, which, who is a journalist, <laughs> one of his, a crew engineer who is an engineer. <laughs> And uh, maybe uh, I have the safety officer who is a doctor, a medical doctor, and uh, yeah. So I, and, and, and I mean, we fit. We at the end we fit. I don't know if you if you want to see that way, but I also feel that most of us we also have kind of redundancy. For example, our, I'm a first responder as well. I guess all of us uh, I know that Simone has already experienced in analog, so I think 
we should worry about all that also might have been able yeah. to help our own as well. Yeah, yeah, for, for sure, for sure. Yeah, there are some, I think, aspects, uh, like my case, uh, military officer, and I went through the astronaut selection and so on, so they, they had already experience in analog missions before, several of them, and so there is some level of resilience that you need to have, because in any case you need to live you know, close to each other with other people in a very small place for like two weeks. That it doesn't seem much, but when you are there, two weeks are two weeks. So it's a, it's a lot of time, 24 hours uh, with, with the same people in a, in a close space. So I think there are some human aspects and the resilience capabilities that you need to have in order to do that. Uh, and I think it's going to be more and more like that. So if you want to participate in this, you need to have something that demonstrates that you can withstand whatever it takes to, you know, whatever will, will happen in, in such situation. So, if we're talking about the two weeks, was there a daily routine? What time would you wake up? What would you do? What time would you sleep? I mean, depending on the... Some days I wanted to, uh, to make time lapse of the sunrise, so I woke up very early. <laughs> and maybe the next day I woke up less early, you know, so it was dependent. Mostly like uh, the... Um, so, we would wake up at 7.30 a.m. Um, and because uh, usually you can plan, uh, uh, you can ask until uh, to the crew support until uh, two EVAs for the day. Uh, there are some certain restrictions, like for example, um, a, a person can conduct two EVAs in the same day, um, and uh, and for for example, at least two people need to uh, stay in the habitat when the others go in an EVA. Uh, there are all like safety restriction uh, that are uh, needed. So uh, we had usually an EVA in the morning and an EVA in the afternoon. And we had to plan also the, the EVAs uh, um, accordingly to the experiments that needed to be done in EVA and also often to the uh, weather condition. That is also another thing that you can simulate uh, for Mars. For example, uh, like uh, um, the wind, the high winds often stop at many of our experiments. So we had to start uh, replan some of the experiment accordingly to the moments of the day in which the, the winds were uh, lower, like in the early morning, for example. And I'm talking about, for example, like the drone flights. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and uh, I, I think this is also something that's that kind of flexibility that we were saying that it would be needed in the Martian mission uh, because you have to deal with the uh, unknowns like that. Uh, and uh, you have to plan for the most successful. Um, like uh, organization of the experiment time. Um, yeah. yeah. They said that the average sleep time was between four and six hours. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. 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 Because uh, yeah. you wake up in the morning, but then you have all the activities, and then you use the night to plan the activities of the day after, or like to replan the, the activities. Mm -hmm. Um, so the spare time, it's very little, I have to say. So you don't have much time for yourself. How many but times did you eat a day? Three, three, three times. times. Yeah. Right, first time. And uh, uh, they are very important moments because these are the moments with so all the crew yeah. you know, stay together yeah. and, uh, and uh, we talk and we bond, but also like we we had a few occasions, for example, to do like uh, free time activities like playing cards or like watching movies because we were always very tired yeah. at the end of the night. Yeah. But we managed also to do some of some yeah, yeah. yeah. So, yeah, sorry. No, I just want to clarify because we were talking about EVAs, but I didn't even talk, described how they Process. work. Yeah. So essentially, uh, the way they work, you need to prepare half an hour, one hour to half an hour before. You have to wear the, the switch simulator with a backpack and a helmet. Uh, you have to have uh, radio checked so that you can come because the, the, the switch have a ventilation system that is really close to your ears. You cannot hear mostly the people are around and so you can be here this and we so you really need the radio to communicate between each other and then the EVA uh, most of the time you take a this, there are vehicles provided uh, that resemble they kind of resemble golf carts but they are utility vehicles electrical utility vehicles and that can withstand like bumpy bumpy roads and the, 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 the site is huge it's kilometers kilometers wide and you uh, go to the declared location, you cannot go elsewhere, and then you they take 20 minutes, half an hour driving there, 
then you may might I don't know, walk for another hour. It's it's most it's like hiking with a 20, 30 kilo uh, backpack and a helmet and, and a suit and gloves and, and boots and going around and collecting samples or, or making and equipment. Right? And again they have equipment as well. So this is the kind of activity you, you do when you're outside in this particular site. And is it does it take pairs to go? At on? least. Yeah. Okay. You, yeah, there's always the buddy system it's called. So there nobody stays alone. Um, even in the station, if somebody is, is alone, we have still have always radios, walkie-talkies to communicate between modules. Um, but yeah, outside, everybody need to stay at the like between the like within the line of yeah. sight. In because if something happens, the radio is not working, you need to see the other person yeah. wherever it is. So that you can assume that people cannot go beyond 100 meters to to the others. Yeah. During the, this extra regular, and also there is the component that we simulate, for example. Pressurization, the pressurization time. So there are air locks that are those elements that are used to allow to pass from a certain pressure to another one. So from the inside to outside. Um, so you, have, so that's what that means. You have to um, like uh, put the internal pressure of this air lock to the pr pressure of the outside before. So you are able to open the door with, uh, without the air escaping. And after, when you enter it, you have to wait that the pressure is rising again to the level of the inside of the habitat. So that can be, I mean, it, and we were doing a, a pressurization, a pressurization time of five minutes, uh, but actually in, in reality, Mars will be around 40 minutes. Mm -hmm. And it's like 40 minutes, you know, you are like there waiting inside that room doing literally nothing. And it can be pretty uh, boring. <laughs> so sometimes we are putting music on. Mm -hmm. and, I think engineers will be faster than pressurization systems. <laughs> 40 minutes, it's like 20, but you can 30 do, years. Yeah, you, can, you can do, you can revise the plans, you can, you can find the time, you can agree on what is going to be the objective of the EVA, what's going to be the success criteria for that EVA, and so on. Um, for the sake of time, I, I would love to have asked a bunch of questions, but I know that you're busy. Um, so I'll ask the final one. Before I let you go, what's the next step? Is there a new mission coming up in the horizon? Or? Well, now there is first <laughs> the analysis of the data produced in this mission. And it will take times, and there are different institutions that will take care of it. Um, and that's the first step. So it's important also because we don't plan mission because we like just to stay in the last for two weeks, but they need to have specific uh, scientific objectives. So. Um, I already know that many of these experiments will have, uh, or at least they need to have a part two. Uh, so definitely this is something. So analyzing the data, we can say, okay, that we need to replan this experiment in a different way, or for example, we need more data. Uh, and so based on those, uh, like on those uh, uh, basically, um, outcome. Yes, outcome considerations, uh, scientific consideration of the outputs of the experiments. We can decide possibly to plan another mission. And we were all thinking that it would be nice to, for example, to choose another location because there are many analogs, uh, as like Benjamin was saying, on Earth. Uh, and uh, so we would also like to explore a different environment, a different habitat. Well, Bye. thank you so much for your time um, and for answering all my questions. And um, I will add all the references to Benjamin's work and all of your work on the description and hope we'll get more people to know about all of this. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.